right, um, so as Hui Jing said, I am Jennifer Wong, and I'm here to talk about designing responsive emails and coding in the year 2000. Um, you all are welcome to follow along by going to this GitHub link here. And to start, uh, so who am I? I am a software engineer at Eventbrite. And before that, I actually worked as a civil engineer, just like these two ladies here. I quickly became bored with the very slow pace of the projects at that time. You know, things, when you're making buildings, it takes years to complete. So I wanted to be in a more innovative space, and I decided that that would be tech. So to get my foot in the door, I started doing um, I started working as a community specialist for a startup, and that meant that I was actually just doing customer support for a company that was around for about 10 years. I totally, totally hated it, and so I decided to teach myself to code. I would work on my projects at nights, I would go to hack nights, hackathons, and I just kept working on these things, and eventually that led to success. Um, and I landed my first job as a front-end developer at a company called Hot Pads. Yay. <laughs> um, so here we go. My first assignment at Hot Pads was to redesign all of our emails and make them responsive. And I was like, oh yeah, no problem. Super easy, right? I started working them on those emails and I thought, oh crap, I have no idea what I'm doing. But fortunately, I'm here to share all of my strategies and mistakes with you all. So my story is about how emails are evil, which I'm sure many of you can relate to if you've ever worked on responsive emails. So I'll talk a bit about design, code, and I'll share some resources that I found along the way. So to start, I'm gonna talk about design. So first things first, when I was working at Hot Pads, they asked me to redesign their welcome email. And I decided to first start by doing a bunch of research. So I signed up for a ton of different services just so I could look at their welcome emails. Um, I thought the prettiest email that I found was actually Indiegogo's, which we can take a look at here very quickly. Oh, there we go. Um, so the first thing I noticed about this email is they have this top anchored logo, so you know exactly where the email is coming from. And as I move down the page, I see a lot of really beautiful image content, and notice that all of their calls to action are the same color. So I can just click on these buttons, on these pink links, um, and also I can click on the images, which is great. So I keep scrolling down. And then I also noticed that they have these social media buttons, but also they have links in text, and that's really great for accessibility. And then I also see, of course, a way to unsubscribe and update your subscription. So some of the takeaways that I found in doing all the research, and again, I received many, many welcome emails, was that most of them were very text light. Many of them were very image heavy. There was always a logo at the very top of the email, and also a max width, so you didn't have your users reading across the page. Um, a quick disclaimer about all those things. So they may not work for everybody, and I highly recommend if you're working on emails is to A-B test all of your emails. So after doing that research, I decided to check out what our welcome email looked like. Get ready. This is what it looked like. Uh, the first thing I noticed, I'm like, why is our logo kind of right in the middle of our email? What's with all that weird spacing? And why is there text after our closing? We're like, welcome on board, but then we add on a bunch of stuff at the end. And then there's also no way to unsubscribe. So seeing that email, I felt very much like Doug. I was like, wow, just wow. All right, so next up I decided to plan, and I was like, what am I making? What am I doing for hot pads? So I had a couple of goals, and those two things were to bring consistency to our emails. Our emails were just all over the place. They all looked different, they all looked crazy. Um, so I wanted to really give them a more formalized template. And I thought that that would bring a lot of brand awareness, because once you see that recognizable template, you know where your emails are coming from. 
Um, so to make or not to make, I decided, or I checked out the internet and saw that there are a ton of pre-made email templates that you can use. So you don't actually have to build them from scratch, and they can be quite helpful. But I actually didn't use them personally, and there are a few reasons for that. Uh, those reasons being that it was my first project as a front-end developer, and I really wanted to get you know, in the nitty-gritty of the code. And so I actually built up our template from scratch. Um, if you guys have less time to work on your emails, pre-made templates can be a really great way to go. Um, when designing emails, it can be really great to sketch. So here you can see I've sketched the same email four different times, and that just gives you a sense of where you want to lay things out, and that can really help uh, before your coding, especially if you don't have a designer. Photoshop can be really great. If you have the skills, I definitely say go for it. Another thing I wanted to think about when I was planning was what I call our rule of thumbs or the minimum touchable area on mobile devices. So I had often heard of the number 44 by 44 pixels. Uh, it turns out that number is wrong. It comes from the original iPhone human interface guidelines for the very first iPhone. And those guidelines don't even exist anymore. So just so you know, actually all mobile devices have a different minimum touchable area, so I've linked to these two pages here, and they definitely help you figure out what that size is. And it's really dependent on what devices are most popular with your users. So here is the new template for our welcome email that I created. Um, I like to say it's a design for the new millennium in the year 2000. Um, so the design I can see is like a little bit outdated, but this is actually what our website looked like back then, and so I was obviously pulling some design cues from our website. And just for comparison, this is what our old email looked like and versus the new one. All right, on to some code. So here's a bunch of tips and tricks that I learned along the way. So some things that I learned before I started coding our emails. Number one, tables are coming. Mozilla Developers Network says, note, prior to the creation of CSS, HTML table elements were often used as a method for page layout. This usage has been discouraged since HTML4, and the table element should not be used for layout purposes. Emails say lol. <laughs> uh, tables are really important in emails. If you don't have a wrapper table in your email, it actually makes all of your code disappear in Apple Mail and Outlook 2011. So make sure you have that outer table. Um, something I also found out was that tables don't display as inline or block or inline block. And I was like, what? What does that mean? Well, tables actually default to display as table. Um, but in that case, Chrome actually will ignore a max width that you set on your emails. So you definitely want to set your table to display as block. Next up is inline styles. You definitely need them. Reason being, Gmail doesn't support a style in the head, Outlook.com doesn't support a link element in the head, and many clients don't support a whole like bevy and slew of CSS. So a really great page to help you know what is supported is Campaign Monitor CSS page here. Um, what you see here is a really great chart which shows all of these different email clients and what, supported, uh, what CSS is supported in them. So unfortunately, you're going to be doing a whole lot of this if you're designing emails. It's really ugly, I know but it's got to happen. All right, again, back to max width. So I think that this company didn't get the memo on max width, and you'll see that their text just kind of goes all the way across the screen, and it just makes it really hard to read. So it's important to set a max width on your email, and typically it's between 550 to 600 pixels, and that's based on most email clients' preview panes. A quick note about comments. When you're writing emails, you're going to have tables within tables within tables, 
And so you're gonna have tables all the way down your page, and it's really important to have comments so you know where you are. So if you go back and look at this code really quickly, you'll see that it's great and super helpful to have comments letting you know where each table begins and ends. All right, image alternatives. Um, it's always great to have an alt tag or a background color on your images. Uh, a lot of browsers and clients don't automatically display images, and so when that happens, it's good to have a backup there. And this is also great for accessibility, so you should be doing it on the web as well. So this is an example of an email in Gmail. Uh, our logo didn't show up, and so it's great to have that alt there so that your users know what image is being loaded. Another thing I did is in our footer, we had that really beautiful, like, image at the very bottom, but I set a background color on that so that the border goes all the way around in case that image isn't showing. Um, and I created a template. You can check it out on GitHub. Why should you template? Well, it's really great to not have to repeat yourself. So here you see two different emails, but all of those little micro um, listings, you'll see they overlap between both. And so those are just kind of little pieces of abstracted code that I don't have to keep writing over and over again. So it's really helpful to have a template. All right, some things I learned while I was coding my emails. Uh, media queries, I'm sure you guys are all really familiar with those. They can be super helpful for readability and also targeting specific devices. A quick note is that there are a lot of clients that don't support media queries, so you'll definitely want to pay attention to those. And Style Campaign did a really great, or did, a, did some really great research on this. And so they tell you which devices and which email clients will support media queries or not. And with media queries, you definitely want to cover your bases, so it's really good to use them in conjunction with fluid layouts. So here I've paired a media query targeting um, devices that are smaller with the percentage-based width here. And that will help you cover all the clients that do and don't support media queries. Um, next up is device pixel ratio. So the device pixel ratio is the ratio between logical pixels and physical pixels. And that will help you target retina or high-res devices. And I'll actually come to a really great example of that in just a bit. All right, important. When should you use it? A lot of people say never, but in emails, it can be necessary. Um, sometimes in emails, your inline styles will overwrite media queries. So here's a really good example of when you actually want to use important. So inline, I have the height and the line height of an element set to 10 pixels. But on actually smaller devices, what I want is to have the height and the line height be five pixels. And so I have to set an important on there when being used with a media query. All right, something weird I learned along the way too is about line height. If you look at the very bottom of this image, you'll see this like thin blue line right at the bottom. And I'm like, what is that? Oh, why is that there? It's so annoying. Um, it turns out that the solution to this is to set a line height on the surrounding column element of your image, and that just brings it down. All right, some things I learned after the release of my emails. Oops. This one is really weird. When you have an image tag and an anchor tag, uh, something strange happens. Sometimes in a client, you'll see that there's this weird gray border around your image. And it's so, it happens so occasionally and so strangely that I don't even have an example of it, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, it turns out the reason for this is actually the white space in your HTML. And so you can actually just move the image tag to be in the same line as your anchor tag, or you can comment out the white space. And that removed that weird gray border. Um, High-res images for retina. So this email actually went out to a bunch of our users. And they were like, what? Oh my god. <laughs> Caution. And I was like, oh crap, I'm sorry. So what was the problem here? The problem was I was using a very large image and then sizing it down for retina devices. 
but Outlook 2007, 2010, 2013, and Outlook in Internet Explorer don't allow for HTML or CSS image resizing. The solution is to set a background image, your retina image, on the surrounding column element, and then set the inner image to display as none. And I found that solution on Campaign Monitor. So here you'll see that's exactly what I've done. So I set a background image on our column element, and then the image inside the column element I set to display as none. So that's how you can use retina images in your emails. Um, another thing is that Outlook 2007, 2010, and 2013 don't support max width. So what you'll want to do here is use a max width bypass. What you do is you set a fluid layout as your baseline. So you'll set that to be your width 100%. Um, so that all use cases use that 100%. But for larger screens, then you'll set the width to be a fixed width instead of using max width. So you may be wondering, Outlook 2007, 2010, and 2013, WTF? Well, the reason for their issues is the rendering engines. Outlook 2000 to 2003 use Internet Explorer to render their emails. Outlook 2007, 10, and 13 use Microsoft Word as their rendering engines, and I'm sure you guys can understand what problems that would cause. Outlook 2011, also called Outlook for Mac, actually uses WebKit to render their emails. And I was like, why did you guys switch back to Microsoft Word in 2013? I don't know. But that's something to keep in mind. Um, again, Gmail doesn't support styles in the head. So if you want to change the color of your links, you actually have to go and style every single anchor tag in line of your email. So definitely think twice before you decide to change that color. <laughs> AOL and Outlook.com, they do these, this really weird thing. Well, the, they'll prefix all of your styles and your classes with either external class or AOL replaced body. A solution to that for at least Outlook.com is you can actually prefix all of your classes yourself, which is great. You can just target them right away. But AOL, you can't do that, because it'll double up the class, and that'll target nothing. So I found out that actually AOL does support Unicode classes, though, but not Unicode IDs. And so that's a really great way to target AOL styles. And that's something that I learned from Mr. Mark Robbins. Um, unfortunately, Android Mail and Outlook.com in Internet Explorer also support the Unicode class, but not the Unicode ID. So targeting AOL is specifically is probably not possible, at least in what I found. But if anybody else knows of anything, definitely let me know. Um, Yahoo, ARG, they really like to strip out a bunch of things. So they'll strip out your overflow X property, they'll strip out any importance that you have, um, and strangely, they'll strip out a display none in line but not in your style block. Something to keep in mind. Uh, WebKit. WebKit and Opera do not mask on your border radius. So you see here in this image um, on the left, you can see that that little border radius in gray, there's a, it's kind of blocked. There's like a little corner missing there. I can't see my border radius. And then the, what I wanted it to show up like is on the right. I wanted to see that border radius there. Um, so what you can do to solve that issue, if you guys ever see that your border radius is missing, is that uh, you can add an intermediate div that doesn't have the CSS positioning on your border ra radius or the, or the overflow hidden. So that's, this is what that looks like. So the parent element is positioned. The intermediate element has the border radius and the overflow hidden, and that's the one that's not positioned, and that's what will allow your border radius to appear. All right, ch 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 changes. So Android Gmail allowed you to use forms prior to version 5.0, but Android Gmail disabled that after Android, or after version 5.0. 
However, Android email does support forms. So basically, you just have to keep rolling with the times. Um, we really wanted to use forms, and you just have to keep doing research on what you can do to make that happen. So you have to stay up to date. And you can stay up to date by checking out a bunch of these resources that I found. Uh, first up, there's a bunch of blogs here. Style Campaign is a great service that is run by a woman named Anna Yeaman. She's a creative director there. And she has a bunch of really amazing solutions. She has this crazy device lab. You can kind of see it in the background here. And she has tons of devices that she's constantly testing on. Litmus is a really great email testing suite. And they allow you to test your emails across many different clients. Campaign Monitor and MailChimp are both online marketing email solutions. And they allow you to send emails, check out analytics, and test your emails, use different templates. So these are all really amazing blogs. They're just working with emails all day. And I found a lot of great information on those. Um, templates. So earlier I mentioned that there are a bunch of pre-made templates that you can use. And so here are a bunch of them. Uh, in the background, you'll actually see the HTML email boilerplate. It's a lot of code. It's really crazy. Uh, but of course, it's going to most likely really hit all of those email clients that you may need to support. So go ahead and check those out. Uh, and lastly, for resources, oops. Come on, keyboard. Uh, testing. Testing your emails is super important. People are reading emails on all types of devices and all types of clients all the time. So a bunch of resources here are both Litmus, Email on Acid, and Targeted I.O. are really great solutions. They, they support a ton of different clients. Um, and Putsmail actually is a free service, and that can be really helpful as well. And that's all I have for you. If you have questions, feel free to find me after the talk. Uh, there is some pseudo cards in CSS, like Hover, or how, how are they working on the, those kinds? Um, so you can actually check out that campaign monitor CSS page, and it'll tell you there are some pseudo classes that are supported and some that are not, and it really depends on the client. Um, how do you deal with the consistency of fonts on across all email clients. That's our concern. I do email clients, email, HTML email as well. And my main problem is the fonts. Mm -hmm. um, I think custom fonts are not supported on mails, right? So how do you make the fonts consistent on all the email clients? <laughs> um, use a standard font. <laughs> I think that's probably your best solution, unfortunately, is to really have just the standard fonts, or if you want to use a custom font, to use it just on the clients that support it, and definitely have like a very uh, you know, sturdy fallback in that case. Uh, is there any way to bypass the image display permissions in Outlook? Like when you first open the mail in Outlook, you have to like click, oh. right click, and uh, give the permission to display. Is there any way to bypass that? I don't think there's a way to do that, unfortunately. Uh, uh, it has to come from the user or consumer side. Okay.